I know you guys have a lot of, um, you're talking about a lot of interdisciplinary topics here. And so I think this will be a perfect fit um, because I'm going to talk some, about something that spans the gamut from cloud physics all the way to black hole dynamics. And, um, and, and we'll get into that now. And so while I was doing my PhD, I was working on imaging clouds um, for cloud physics and climate applications. But then now I'm working on imaging black holes. And some of you might think, well, these two seem unrelated and very different. But what I kind of want to highlight in this talk is how computationally they share a lot of similar, a lot of the same challenges, right? So this is what I want to highlight. Um, and the key aspect that I want to, uh, the key theme throughout this talk is that we can uh, design these, these algorithms, these computational algorithms. If we look at, um, if we look at nature as sort of layers of an onion. So we have these different models and we can start peeling off layers of an onion. And this, this is true both for, for imaging clouds and for imaging black holes. So you can go, um, in the case of clouds, what we did was we took the observations, which were, um, uh, here I'm showing this, this is JPL's high altitude aircraft. Um, and you have these multi-view observations and you wanna take these sort of seemingly unstructured observations, quote unquote, and produce uh, some structure, in this case, is the 3D densities uh, of clouds. And so you can peel off another layer of this onion. And you, oh, oh, sorry. And the main challenge here was that when you're looking into clouds, um, you're not seeing, you're not seeing the, um, the illumination that is scattered once or twice. What you're seeing is the solar illumination that's scattered multiple times. Right? So this is challenging computationally because you can think of this as a sort of recursion that you have to uh, work out. And so you can peel off another layer of this onion and we took it one step further and we said, let's model how um, a vector property of light, which is polarization, how is this vector property is impacted by scattering within the cloud. And maybe we can learn something about not just the densities, but also the sizes. So maybe we can see, you know, in one part of the clouds, the droplets are bigger and another part of the clouds, the distribution of droplets are smaller. And this will help us learn um, more about cloud physics. Okay, and so taking the same kind of approach into uh, black hole observations. So here we have these interferometric observations, which I will talk about in a second. Um, and as the Event Horizon Telescope, we take these unstructured observations that we produce this image. And here I'm showing the image of uh, Sagittarius A star, which is the black hole in the center of our galaxy. Um, but the question that I'm asking here at, at Caltech is, can we take it one step further and step out of this image plane, which is just a projection, and maybe look at dynamics or at the 3D evolution around a black hole? So these are new algorithms that we're developing uh, for imaging black holes. Okay, and so this is a, this is the common theme here. We can we can build this sort of spectrum of of approaches where each each part has different model assumptions. So we need to assume something about the model to build, to, to, uh, to peel another layer of this onion, but we can construct these flexible algorithms that allow for scientific discovery. And I'll, I'll return to this spectrum of model assumptions throughout the talk. Okay, so without further ado, we can dive in and I'm gonna start this talk by taking us on a journey to um, the heart of the Milky Way galaxy. So this is an image that if you go out where um, light pollution is low, maybe you can take a nice optical image like this. Um, and if we move on to radio light, we can start zooming in all the way to the center of the galaxy. So I don't know if you guys are seeing this animation. Um, sometimes it works over Zoom and sometimes it doesn't. But what we're seeing here are actually, you guys can see it? Yeah. Okay, great. So we're zooming in through um, through the interstellar dust all the way into the center of the galaxy. And each of these successive zoom-ins you might've noticed are, is actually a different image, right? So these are a bunch of image, uh, stacked, images stacked together with some nice animation. So it's not a continuous zoom. And, and each of these zoom-ins is actually from a different instrument, a different radio observatory around the world. Now, even if we go to the most sensitive uh, radio observatory that we have in Chile, we still can't resolve this uh, bright radio source at the center of the galaxy. So we know the center of the galaxy is bright, but we can't resolve it. We don't know how it looks like. 
And so um, this is if we treat each of these sites individually, they don't have the resolving power, but if, we, if they're linked together and they all observe the same source in the sky, they create this virtual instrument that's called the Event Horizon Telescope or EHT for short. And with the EHT, we're finally able for the first time to resolve this bright radio source and, and see that it has a structure of a ring or if you're American, it's a donut. Okay, so this is the first image of uh, Sagittarius A star, the bright radio source in the center of our galaxy. And as I was uh, starting to talk about this in the beginning of the talk, this is not a regular photograph. This is a computational image. And so it's comprised of, uh, it's, it's made of these measurements of these different radio telescopes. And later today, I'll talk about um, some of the challenges that we faced in reconstructing this image. Um, but before I do that, I want to dive a little bit into the science of this image and why it's interesting. Um, now, this image was a joint effort of over 300 scientists from different institutions around the world. And I won't go into all of the details, uh, but I do want to talk a little bit about the computational aspects of it. And so, I guess the first kind of question that will pop into someone's mind is, is this a black hole, right? So I'm showing you an image and I'm talking about black holes. Well, is this an image of a black hole? Now, the question is a little bit involved, a little bit complicated. And so I'm going to sidestep this question today and I'm going to ask a different question. If it is a black hole, what exactly are we seeing here? Okay, so as some of you may know, Black holes are not directly visible. They're actually characterized by something called an event horizon, which is a region from which nothing can escape, not even photons. So what are we seeing here? Well, what we think we're seeing here is uh, something called the accretion disk. So luckily, supermassive black holes are theorized to be surrounded by this bright gas, which is sort of like a giant cosmic flashlight. And this diffuse cloud of gas orbits and it feeds the black hole. And this is in fact, and what we're seeing here might be the smoking gun of a black hole on the backdrop of this bright accretion disk. So we can see that there's a dip in the center of this donut, which is, um, which is uh, um, thought to be the shadow of the black hole. So at this point, um, you might have a feeling of deja vu. Maybe you've, you've, you think you've seen this image before and you might remember the first image of a black hole that made a lot of headlines. And that's the image of the black hole in the center of the M87 galaxy. Now, as far as black holes go, M87, M87 star and Sag J star could not be any more different in their astrophysics, but they both appear as rings, which is by itself a remarkable scientific discovery. So why do they appear as rings? Well, if you look close at the animation on the right, this visualization, what you can see is that as the view angle changes, right? The camera is changing view angle throughout this animation. We're still, we're seeing this sort of funhouse mirror effect. And no matter what view we're looking at this accretion disk, we're still seeing a ring or a ring-like structure. And this is caused by gravitational lensing. Um, and this effect is what's, uh, and what we're actually seeing um, is the brightness from behind the black hole is still able to come through being gravitationally lensed onto the image plane. And, and that's what's causing it to still appear as a ring, okay? And so this effect creates these ring-like structure. And so there's a good chance that the universe might be full of these uh, donuts and the EHT is only scratched the surface with these first two. And so, where exactly does the ring-like structure come from? Let's look at this um, nice animation here. And so if we have a, a very massive object, it's going to, according to general relativity, it will bend space-time. And what will happen is that photons will appear to be moving on curved trajectories. So here, if we have, for example, a bright spot behind a black hole, it's not being occluded by the black hole. This is what I was describing before it's actually gonna be distorted and show itself as a ring on the image plane, right? So from, from Earth, we, could, we see brightness behind the black hole as this ring. Okay, 
And so later on in the talk, I'll talk about how we can leverage um, this gravitational lensing effect. Okay, so going back to our galactic center, um, astronomers have actually be stu been studying Sagittarius A star for many years, over 20 years for sure. And in fact, they already know that Sag A star is a very massive object. So here I'm showing, I'm showing a time lapse um, where through careful tracking of these, um, these stars close to the galactic, the galactic center, they calculated that to explain all these orbits, there must be something really massive compacted in the galactic center. In fact, this, they calculated something on the order of 4 million solar masses. And although they didn't uh, conclusively determine that Sag A star is a black hole, if you can read the fine print here, you'll see that they discovered a compact, a supermassive compact object at the center of the galaxy. This was still a major discovery that led, um, led Genzel and Getz to share the 2020 Nobel Prize in physics. Um, so this was a big discovery here. And using the mass, this 4 million, solar, 4 million solar masses extracted from these stellar orbits and assuming a model for gravity, so assuming general relativity, we can get a prediction for the black hole shadow diameter, which is in remarkable agreement with the image ring diameter. And so this is another beautiful, um, this is another beautiful result, beautiful scientific result where we have these two completely separate approaches, and they reach a remarkably similar conclusion about the apparent ring diameter. And to take us back to this model of assumption, assumptions we have this, um, we have this approach that assumes a gravitational model, so that's a fairly strong assumption there, um, and assumes that there, there's a black hole there in the center, and we can extract the ring diameter using a model for gravity, and on the other end, we have an approach that doesn't really assume anything about gravity or, or the existence of a black hole. And the fact that they both come to an agreement means that we gain confidence in both the gravitational model and the image result. Okay, so they, they strengthen each other. Okay, so that was a really brief overview, overview of some of the science of the image of um, Saturday star. And I wanna talk mostly about the computational challenge beca challenges because that's what I deal with day to day here. Um, and so let's talk about the challenges that we face when analyzing EHC data. And to do that, I wanna start by describing some aspects of how this unique instrument works. And so, the EHT, as I said, it's this global network of telescopes and abstracting away much of the detail here, each telescope pair acquires a single measurement in the frequency domain, so in the Fourier space of the underlying image. So this means that, and the, the frequency is proportional to the baseline between the two telescopes. Now this is not the geographical baseline, it's not how far they are, this is something called the projected baseline which is the baseline projected onto the line of sight. Okay, so this means that telescopes which are nearby um, are sensitive to broad diffuse, in VLBI telescopes that are nearby are sensitive to broad diffuse features in the image. So, um, so these, these broad features in the, in the Saturday star image. And then telescopes that are far, far apart, they're sensitive to the high frequency features or the details, okay? And so what happens is, and as the Earth moves, you can see that the projected baselines, if you look at these lines, they change because it's projected onto the line of sight. So as the Earth rotates, um, they change, and, and you, the HD starts scanning this Fourier plane of the image, and this makes the inverse problem of recovering the image from the Fourier samples more tractable. Okay, but there is uh, a really crucial underlying assumption here which is that the source that you're looking at is static um, throughout acquisition because you're acquiring more and more Fourier samples and you wanna say that this is the same Fourier of the same underlying static source. And this assumption uh, was true for the observations of M87 star, um, but in fact, it took us the observations of M87 and Saturday star were during the same campaign, but it took almost three extra years uh, to analyze the data from Saturday star. And the reason was um, that Sagittarius star is dynamic on the timescale of acquisition, right? So 
you're no longer looking at something that's static over the course of a night, like M87. Now you're looking at, so at something that's moving on the order of minutes. And um, as a computational analog, I like to think of a patient sitting within an MRI machine and refusing to sit still. So you're trying to acquire these samples in the Fourier space, but the patient keeps moving. Okay. And so I think these next two slides kind of highlight the challenge that we face with the EHT. So here I have a simulation of, of what the accretion around Sagi star might look like. And I'm showing the Fourier, um, the Fourier uh, transform of this simulation. So there's the magnitude and the phase. And if we, if we only highlight what the EHT sees, we're left with something like this. Right? So we can see how very sparse this is, first of all. Um, the second challenge is we can see that the samples are moving. Okay, so as the Earth rotates, the location of these samples is, is changing. And the third part is that um, the colors are changing also because the underlying source is moving, right? So we have these two dynamic processes and we want to decouple them. Okay, and so we couldn't just recycle our imaging algorithms from M87, and we had to develop new imaging pipelines to take the observations of SAJ star and produce this image that I showed you before. And in fact, there wasn't a single algorithm that produces this image. These are four different independent algorithms and each one of them produced thousands of candidate images, right? So the image that I'm showing you on the right is actually an average of hundreds of thousands of images. And so, um, and so I wanna, <laughs> Today, I want to highlight, a I'm not going to talk too much about the imaging algorithms, which is um, um, something that I had some part in, but I didn't lead. I want to talk about something that I was leading, which was crucial um, for getting confidence in that image of a ring on the right that you see. And what I want to talk about is generating synthetic data that mimics SAJ star. So this is something that I was co-leading within the EHT. And the crucial part is that when you're, you're doing remote sensing, you don't know what's out there. <laughs> and so to gain confidence in your imaging pipelines, you have to really test them thoroughly on synthetic simulations. Um, and this is how you build your, your confidence. And so on the left, I'm showing um, the data from the real subject star observations in black and then a simulation in red. And this simulation is meant to mimic the observations. Okay, so how do we generate these realistic um, simulations of SAJ star? Well, one thing that we could do is we could um, take the full physics simulations, which, which are in this case, general relativistic magnetohydrodynamics. Okay, so it's GRMHD for short. And then that's what we're seeing on the left. And then we can simulate the sensor, which is the HD, and we can produce these synthetic observations, which are great. And we did that. But, um, but something that was crucial, as I said, we needed to build confidence that there is actually a ring-like structure out there, right? We got a ring structure, but how do we know that there's a ring structure if we only test our algorithms on these um, GRMHG simulations that by construction have a ring, we wouldn't know if, uh, if our algorithms are able to detect a non-ring-like morphology. And so we needed something that was more flexible but still challenging. And so for that, we developed these uh, stochastic models of accretion flows. And so these are random fields, which we can have any sort of time average image um, as, as the time average structure. And then we can, we can really test our algorithms in a situation where the dynamics are similar to the accretion of Sag star. They're physically motivated, but also they're flexible enough um, to help us detect if there is no rings, um, if, there, if there isn't really a ring structure. Okay, so in the next couple of slides, I'll talk a little bit about these stochastic models of accretion. And so how did we generate these, uh, these, uh, this synthetic data set? Well, we generated these, we, we take a static image, which is the time average, and we modulate it by this spatial temporal random field that has correlations on long, uh, short and long time scales and also um, short and, and small scales in, in, the, in the image. And so how do we generate these, uh, these random fields is also an interesting question um, because these are uh, correlated spatial temporal fields. And it turns out that in high dimensions, this is a non-trivial computational challenge. 
And so one interesting approach to generate these spatial temporal fields, and, and again, the key is that unlike uh, the typical fields that we work with, which are images, um, we, you can't, at these high dimensions, you can't hold the covariance matrix in memory. So you have to do something a bit, uh, a bit different. And so here, what we did was we used this um, stochastic PDE, stochastic partial differential equation approach, where you take a PDE um, and you input uh, a random noise source. And if it's Gaussian and the PDE is linear, then on the output, what you get is a Gaussian random field, which exhibits the correlations. Um, that you're after, and these correlations are dictated by the PDE coefficients, right? So essentially, instead of uh, representing a random field with a big covariance matrix, what you have is PDE coefficients, um, and they only capture local interactions and not, um, not global um, correlations. Okay, and so the correlations here in this case are this, you can see that there's this vector field of of a velocity field that dictates where things tend to move. And then there's the spatial correlations here, which is a sort of spiraling pattern. So each image appears to be a spiral, um, but uh, appears to be a spiral and appears to move in, in some direction. Okay, so these models were flexible enough and they were physically motivated and they were, uh, and through them we were able to build confidence in our imaging algorithms uh, and imaging Saturday star. Um, but also, instead of generation, one key question that we were asking is, could, could we use these models directly for inference? So what do I mean here? Um, I mean, instead of just generating synthetic data to test the imaging algorithm, could we use them as an imaging algorithm? Could we take um, event horizon EHT measurements and, and, and recover the unknown parameters of this random field plus a static image, okay? And before I go into the details, I wanna highlight why we think this is a good approach and put it into perspective with respect to that um, spectrum that I was talking about. And so the overall goal, what is the goal? The overall goal is to analyze a dynamic source, right? That's the goal. Uh, society started dynamic, we wanna analyze a dynamic source. And so the naive approach would be, well, you have a way to generate one image like M87, you can break apart your measurements in time to different frames, different segments, and then recover a video one frame at a time, right? And if you do that, you get something that looks like what I'm showing on the right. So you can see that the reconstruction has barely any correlation with the underlying structure. And it fails to recover any meaningful structure. And the reason is that the, the frame, the, the reason is that the, the observations are just too sparse at any given frame in time, okay? And so one thing that you could say, well, we know that the underlying source is a continuous physical process. Maybe we just uh, reconstruct the whole video at once and enforce um, the continuity, so enforce some temporal regularization. And this indeed dramatically improves, improves things. And you can see here on the right that uh, we are able to capture something that looks like um, the time average image. I don't know if you can see the little motion that we have, there is some little motion in there, um, but it's not capturing the clockwise rotation that the source um, has. So because of this strong temporal regularization, we kind of squashed out the dynamic single, signal. And so in fact, we did that to uh, the real SAT star data. And here I'm showing uh, actual videos from April 6 and April 7. And the overall conclusions were uh, the, the overall result was some, somewhat inconclusive. And so we can put these approaches on this spectrum of, of, uh, of approaches. And here we have on the right-hand side, we have very little assumptions. So frame by frame, each frame is independent. On the, on the sorry, on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, we have a static image. That's a very strong assumption because we're saying the source is static. In between, we have this continuous video, which allows for smooth, or, um, or, or slight transitions between frame to frame. And we can take it all the way to the far right-hand side where we put a strong model assumption. We can put the physically realistic black hole model parameters. And hypothetically, maybe we can search over this space of, of GRMHD simulations and recover the parameters uh, of the black hole simulation. But this approach has both a conceptual and a practical problem. So the practical problem is 
that the current computational complexity of these uh, simulations is just too too great to search over. This is this is currently intractable, but this is not as bad as um, the conceptual problem that, that's more crucial. That like when in the same way that when we designed the synthetic data, we wanted to avoid biasing a reconstruction towards the existence of a black hole. If we recover the parameters of a black hole simulation, then we're blind to any deviation from reality. Uh, and so uh, and so we're not flexible and we don't allow for scientific discovery in the case that there's not a black hole. Okay, so this was the conceptual problem of this approach. And we feel that this approach of recovering a physically motivated flow field um, plus a static image is somewhere in the center of the spectrum. So the surrogate model model has the the surrogate random field model has the flexibility um, and it has reasonable dynamic um, assumptions and then the static image is able to capture arbitrary morphologies. So if there's not a ring-like structure, will this will come out from the data? Okay, and so one key. I won't go into all the technical details. I want to talk about one key computational challenge that might get you thinking. Um, if we're trying to recover the parameters of a random field, um, it's driven by this unknown random noise source. And so pixel, drive, pixel values are driven by the random noise source, which we don't want to estimate. That is the same dimensionality of the video itself. And so here, for example, we have these two uh, random fields, and they have the same underlying statistics, so the same PDE coefficients, and they result in very different pixel values over time. So if we wanted to determine uh, that they are similar in, this, in the PDE coefficient space, we can't just compare pixel by pixel, right? We can see that this will not be a good metric for us. And so we had to think about what kind of metric uh, we can use to extract um, the underlying statistic di statistics directly from EHC measurements. And so I remind you that the statistics are actually encapsulated by these unknown PDE coefficients. And as a lot of the times when you're working with high dimensional data, the solution presents itself in the form of dimensionality reduction. And so what we did is we took the, um, for a given set of PDE coefficients, we can extract the top modes of this PDE. And so these top modes will capture most of the variability in the random field. And then we can project the random field. So here I'm showing the projection of the random field onto the subspace spanned by these modes. So that's just a linear combination of the modes. And now we can directly compare the projection with um, the random field. Now, if these can be compared on a pixel by pixel basis, and if they're, and, and we can see if they're similar or not. So what happens if we take a different set of PD coefficients? So now I, I change the set of PD coefficients, but I took the same uh, random field and projected onto a different set of modes. And you can see that this mode, these modes no longer capture the spiraling shape. And so the projection doesn't look as similar to the random field. Right, so you can see where I'm getting with this. We can we can sort of build a metric that tells us how far by by using this um, dimensionality reduction and projection, we can we can have a metric that is sensitive um, to the underlying PD coefficients. Okay, um, let's see what's the time. Okay, I'll go quickly over some simulation results because I still have more other other topics to talk about, and so. Uh, what we did was we took this um, um, we took this underlying true source here, and we can generate observations from it. And we wanted to compare the two approaches. One is to recover a whole video, and then do some subsequent analysis. This could be optical flow or any analysis that you want to um, to study dynamics. And you can see that the optical flow again it fails. It it fails to capture. Um, the true source uh, dynamics, which is in this case is, is a somewhat of a clockwise rotation. Now, if we do our analysis where we have a model for the flow plus a static image, what we see is that we're uh, in, this, in this vector plot on the right, you can see that we're actually able to recover the, the right dynamic, uh, the, the right dynamics for the source. And, and so another thing that we could do is um, we can ask, what about the black hole model? And so here we can use the black hole model as sort of validation. So we can use this model to, um, 
um, to generate observations and see how our surrogate approach works um, mm -hmm. on this black hole model. And you can see that it works reasonably well, even when there's a quite a big model mismatch here between um, this simple flow model and the GRMHG. Okay, uh, I'm gonna skip through some slides here. Okay, so um, I skipped through some slides. We can go back to them if we have time, but I wanna get to the next part. Um, and so I wanna give a short recap. Uh, so far, we talked about how we avoided biasing image and video reconstruction by steering clear of a black hole model, right? I said, this is bad. We don't wanna assume that there's a black hole out there. Now I've shown the first images and videos of Sajay Star, which are based on real EHD observations. And I've also shown a new approach that we're developing uh, which looks promising in simulation. And so all of the analysis that I've shown so far was on the image plane. So this is a, an analysis of the projection of what is actually out there. And so in the last part of the talk, I wanna talk about um, how we could leverage the black hole model. So, um, so we can assume that there is a black hole there and we can leverage a black hole model um, to recover the 3D volume around the black hole. And in fact, when I say a black hole model, I actually mean two very different things here. Um, one is general relativity, and that dictates how the trajectories of photons around the black hole. And the other one is uh, the astrophysics, the general relativistic magnetohydrodynamics. And this MHG model is, uh, and so these two are very different models. So ge general relativity, is a model that passed many rigorous tests with flying colors. And on the other hand, MHD is very difficult to test or study outside of computer simulations. And so we're hoping that using GR, we can learn or study something about the complex um, fluid dynamic processes in the galactic center. Okay. And so um, it, again, in contrast to the previous analysis that I talked about, the goal is slightly different. The goal here is if there is a black hole, what can we learn about the accretion physics around it? And so in this next work that I'm gonna talk about, we're interested in uh, a sort of tomography. This takes us back, back to cloud tomography that I was talking about in the beginning. And I wanna talk about um, some of the key challenges um, that we faced. And I'll start with the first challenge. So the first challenge is, that we only have access to a single viewpoint, right? So in the astronomical setting, when you're looking that far away into the galactic center, any earth size baseline is insignificant and you actually only have a single viewpoint of the source. And this is in contrast to what you typically have when you look at other types of tomography or 3D reconstruction, where you are viewing the same static object or medium um, from different, from multiple viewpoints. And so in principle, if you only have access to a single viewpoint, then a tomography is very ambiguous because, um, because what you're seeing are integrals. And so if we look at one pixel, this red pixel, that's an integral over the values over the emission along this red curve. And you can swap the emission at every given point and you'll still get the same integral, right? So, so single viewpoint tomography is ambiguous. Um, and so how can we resolve this uh, ambiguity? Well, the key is, um, again, a model for orbit dynamics, right? So we're using the dynamics in our advantage here. And so what we're saying is we're actually are replacing these multiple views by multiple frames over time. So we are allowing things to orbit the black hole and we get to see them from different view as time goes on. Uh, and if we have a good model for that, then we can, uh, then we can reconstruct this uh, some canonical or, emission or initial 3D emission. And so this is sort of like having access to only a single uh, X-ray and wanting to do a, a medical CT. And so what you could do is you could ask the patient to rotate. So please rotate while you acquire another image and another image. And in the end, you might be able to get um, a, reconst a 3D reconstruction of the patient. And so these two, uh, the orbit dynamics and the orbit of photons is controlled by general relativity, which just has a handful of parameters, the mass and spin. Um, and in this work, we assume that they're known. In reality, they're not known. 
the mass of sad J star is known to uh, uh, a pretty good we have a pretty good estimate of the mass. If you remember the Nobel Prize winning work that estimated at around 4 million uh, solar masses, but the spin is very unconstrained. And so it would be beneficial for future work to see if we can uh, jointly estimate these parameters of the model. Okay, so how do we, um, how do we go from um, to the full measurement model? Well, we, we start off with this initial 3D emission and we can propagate this in time using a model for orbit dynamics, and then we can ray trace this um, with a model for um, for with a geodesic model of how photons orbit the black hole. And then we can generate this synthetic view from Earth, and we can take this synthetic view from Earth. We can take the Fourier transform of it and sample it according to the EHT telescope positions at any given time. So this is how we go from the unknowns all the way to the measurements. And in the inverse problem, we're actually trying to resolve what is the most likely 3D emission and what is this unknown rotation axis. And so the assumption here is that uh, we have a Keplerian velocity field. And so we're saying that the, the magnitude of the velocity changes just as a function of radius and, and it's a known function. But what we don't know is about which axis everything is rotating or equivalently, where is the camera um, located? Okay, so in the next couple of minutes, um, I'll try to give a, a brief overview of, um, of, the, of the approach. And one interesting aspect that is becoming very fashionable um, in computer vision and graphics is how to represent three-dimensional and higher dimensional fields. And the traditional approach relies on some form of um, grid discretization. So we can take this 3D medium, uh, X, Y, Z coordinates, and we can discretize it, and we can have some interpolation kernel, and we can represent this, um, and we can re represent it that way. Now, um, more recently, people have been using something that's called coordinate-based neural networks. Um, and, and this is one instance of that is neural radiance field, which is very successful in graphics. Um, and here, instead of representing the medium uh, on a discrete grid, we have this neural network do this heavy lifting for us. And so this neural network, um, this coordinate based network in a nutshell, it takes in uh, real valued coordinates. So here X could be in 3D, it would be X, Y, Z and that's real value, so that just three numbers, and then it will output, you have, uh, um, you have a fully connected, uh, a couple of fully connected layers, and it will output just a single scalar value, which is the emission at that point X. Okay, and then you can change this X in a continuous fashion, and you can get the emission at any point, um, at any point X, okay? And the output in, in other cases could be a vector quantity, it doesn't have to be a scalar like in our case, um, you can think of at any point you might want to represent not just the emission, you might want to add, a, um, um, let's say, if you want to add directionality, you can have like a spherical harmonics expansion or something of that sort. Uh, but the key idea is that you have this neural network approximating um, your discretization, and it turns out to be very beneficial for several reasons, one of them being scalability. Um, I won't go into that right now, but this is a very interesting approach that we've used. Okay, so we have this, uh, let me go back. And so this neural network is a set of parameters theta here. And so we have this uh, theta parameters and they represent, they actually represent the unknown 3D emission. So how do we estimate these parameters for measurements? Well, let's go back to our model. Um, and so let's look at a single pixel over time. And so we have this red pixel and we can trace it back um, I don't know if you can see my cursor. And so we can trace it back along this geodesic. And then the value of this pixel will actually just be uh, the integral over the emission along this uh, red curve. Okay. And so for each coordinate X and each time T, we can ask where was this point T time units ago, right? So we, 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 we used our dynamic model to say, where were you in the, in the time zero or the canonical time? And so then we can take this coordinate x0 and ask, and ask the neural network to tell us what is the estimate 
of the emission at this point x zero, right? So we can do that for every point x and every time t. We just take this point x, we trace it back along uh, this velocity field to find where it was, and then we ask the neural network, what is the emission at that point in time? At that point, sorry. Um, and so in this way, we can generate every single pixel at every given time. And then we can, as I said before, we can take the Fourier uh, transform of this and we can sample it according to the EC telescope. Now this gives us a model prediction. And so then we can take this model prediction and compare it to measurements. And now everything here is differentiable. And so we can actually propagate these gradients back to, um, uh, we can propagate gradients and that will allow us to estimate the network parameters, which I remind you just capture um, the 3D emission volume and also this rotation axis. Okay, um, so that was in a nutshell the, um, the approach that we took. And one interesting application for this, for this tomography is um, tomography of emission flares. So we occasionally have flares coming from the galactic center. And you can imagine these as uh, this intense cosmic fireworks show. So there's a fireworks show and we get the signals here on earth and we can see that there's something happening. And so these flares show up as intensities and as, as spikes in the light intensity measures, measured by earth telescope. And so one hypothesis is that these flares are coming from these compact bright regions, bright spots that are close to the event horizon. And without going into the physics, um, it's thought that these processes are not too dissimilar from solar flares. So we have these compact regions of brightness um, that emerge suddenly, and then they start shearing out and they join the rest of the accretion disk. So they join the background disk. And if we're lucky, the each team might capture one of these transient events so that we can study them. And so in, uh, in some simulations that we've conducted, we can see that um, given 40 minutes of EHT coverage, we're able to actually recover a good estimate of, uh, of these hotspots. You can see the estimate on the right. And we're actually able to recover hotspots that form behind the black hole and initially are only seen through gravitational lensing. Okay, so the only way that we see this hotspots behind the black hole is because they're gravitationally lensed, but then they, orbit and they shear out and we get to see a different view angle of the of these hotspots. Okay, so I have a couple more minutes and I'll use them for some summary summary and an outlook. Um, and so in the in this talk I described how um, flexibility across this spectrum of model assumptions or spectrum of computational models can highlight different aspects and reveal um, new structures or reveal new contrast of the same underlying phenomena. Okay, and these proof of concept have actually opened a lot of interesting directions for future re uh, research. And so, for example, um, these uh, images and video that I've shown you um, of Sad Day Star are actually from quiet or quiescent days of Sad Day Star from April 6th and 7th of 2017. And I told you we might get lucky and the EHT might capture a flare or, um, and we could analyze that. But in fact, the EHT did actually capture an explosive day um, in April 11 of 2017. And one future direction is to try to apply this uh, tomography approach to this complicated explosive day data, which so far is unanalyzed. Okay, so one ingredient that is proving to be crucial um, in doing that is polarization. Okay, so right now I'm working on modeling not just the intensity of light, but also um, uh, the polarization, and um, and and this is this is turning out to be a crucial component here. Um, the last future direction that I want to mention today is a, another interesting computational problem that I'm particularly interested in, and it the question is could we go beyond the spectrum of these models that we know? So. Could we actually step off this spectrum and instead of fitting models that we know, learn the physics directly from data? And so this is a question a lot of people are grappling with in different fields um, and it's making and they're making some progress. And I think it's, uh, it could be a really great marriage between machine learning and physics. So the goal here would be to take the data and learn the dynamic equation 
dynamic equations. And then I think this really harnesses the power of machine learning to analyze these huge data sets while maintaining um, interpretability and, and the ability to generalize. Um, the last point that I wanted to highlight is that we're working on all these algorithmic concepts, but they're actually driving um, observations. So they're driving the steel. These algorithms are driving steel. And so uh, Alex mentioned in the beginning that our work into cloud tomography is actually being funded by the ERC to launch these 10 nanosatellites to perform large tomography and study these clouds um, for um, to, uh, and study cloud physics. And in the same way, these algorithms that we're developing for the EHT are now driving some of the, um, um, the planning of the next generation EHT, which is a plan to, um, to join new telescopes into the EHT network. And it's, uh, and it's helping decide on the scientific agenda by showing new capabilities. And my last slide is, uh, maybe this is the next generation EHT. Um, and so this is, uh, this is just my son uh, being, uh, when he was first born, he was obsessed with uh, high contrast um, things like all babies. And so, so we got this t-shirt from the HD and he was just like staring it down. And then um, as he's growing, we now have Sadiq Star here. And so we'll see where this takes us with the next uh, black hole image. And that's, yeah, that's the, my final slide here. So I'm happy to take questions. Great, thanks very much. Yeah, that was a really good talk. Thanks, thanks so much for that. So um, as usual, what we'll do is we'll take some questions in the room first, but if there's anybody online who's got a question, just uh, stick your hand up. And then when I kind of come around to you, I'll just kind of call on you to ask a question. Alternatively, uh, put a question in the chat and I'll, I'll read it out. Okay, um, any questions from, from the room? Okay, we've got a couple of questions over here. Let me just see, um, Fraser, talk loudly and we'll hear if the speaker can hear you, otherwise I'll need to bring the mic across. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, um, so you mentioned in one of your slides, you already have a single point of view, I guess in the galactic sense, because well, Earth doesn't really move much in comparison to the distance of a black hole. But for like a binary system, could use the lensing from one black hole to help provide additional information in the other one? Like, are yeah. there systems which would benefit from tomography from multiple views? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good question. I am not aware right now that the, there's any binary systems that are within reach of the EHD. I think right now, um, but, but it could be it could be a good question for the future. Um, I think that um, even with a single view, you get you need to you need to take into account the lensing. And so one thing that we were wondering is is that how much uh, of the component um, of our ability to recover from a single view is the the lensing, the the fact that we're able to see um, you know what's going on behind the black hole and so on. And how much of it is the, the model for the dynamics? And it seems that most of it is the model for the dynamics. So most of it is not uh, the lensing, but it's actually the fact that if you wait a little bit, things will orbit and you'll be able to see them better from a different angle. So I think, yeah, lensing can be taken advantage of. Um, and it's interesting to think about these binary systems, but I don't have a good question, good answer to say um, if, there's, if there's feasibility for tomography in these cases. Okay, uh, are there any other questions? Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll go back to Fraser's second question in a second. Um, so what do you see as the biggest bottleneck in terms of the resolution for the images? Is it something on the model side or is it the actual physical data you're getting? Like if you had more telescopes linked together in the HT, would you be able to look at more areas of the Fourier space and would that help the resolution more or would it be having more info, more physics informed models that are, are able to constrain the data more. Yeah, that's that's a great question. So I think I think it's a good mixture of both. It depends on what what is your target. So so for for example, for um, for M eighty seven, I I would say it's definitely um, the telescope side. So so we need so that's uh, this 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 collaboration called the Next Generation Event Horizon Telescope. 
um, is working towards uh, where should we build new telescopes and which telescopes could we add, which existing telescopes could we add to the network and so on. And, and one big bottleneck is yes, more telescopes and, and where to put them. Um, and so recently, one of the uh, collaboration members, Haino, uh, has gotten a grant, an ERC grant to, um, for uh, telescopes in uh, Namibia. And, and so people are talking about different telescopes and, and where should we add them to cover um, the UV plane, the Fourier plane, um, as best we can. So that's one aspect, the actual steel. Um, the other aspect, as I, I mentioned, that it took us three years to analyze the subject, three extra years. To analyze the SAJ star data. And, and this was all data analysis. And so a lot of the blurring in the SAJ star cases, because as I said, we're averaging over 100,000 uh, different images that are coming from uh, a computational algorithm um, that, that outputs you know, hypotheses for these images. And so, so yes, better data processing for SAJ star, for example, um, could give us more information. Um, uh, the, the fact was that it was very challenging. Um, so I think it's a good combination of both. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly very interested in, uh, in Sajay Star, not because it's challenging, but also because it's dynamic and it's on, on a time scale, on a short time scale. But, but for example, M87 is also dynamic, just on a large, large time scale. And so if we could have regularly spaced intervals of observations, uh, instead of the week that we have uh, once a year, if we could have like every three days for a period of three years or four years, and these are proposals that have been proposed, um, this will let us analyze the dynamics of ME7 and so on. So I think it's a, mix, a good mixture of both. Just, just like adding on to that question, um, for the for the ME87 saying we need you know, more telescopes, is it the, the shorter baselines or the longer baselines that you need more, uh, more coverage in? Yeah, um, so so a lot of this is kind of depending on your your scientific um, objective, I guess. So so let's say if you're trying, the question is, are you trying to, uh, what are you trying to learn about? So so for example, M87 has this huge jet coming out, spanning the entire length of the galaxy almost. And if you're trying to uh, study the jet, then you need the short baselines, right? Because you need to, um, you have this large scale structure that you need to resolve. Um, and then also, if you want to study the jet and the accretion at the same time, you you might need high dynamic range. So you might want um, you might want telescopes with high dynamic range or higher than what we currently have. Um, and so so this would be a different aspect. Now, if you want to study um, uh, the photon ring and look at general relativity and the photon ring and so on, and maybe recover the um, uh, the spin and the mass through HD observations and so on then you need the really fine, you want to resolve this really fine scale structure. Um, and then you need the high, um, I, I guess, the, um, the high frequencies. And so, so large baselines. And, and so, you know, you could also think about people are talking about sending um, uh, interferometers into space. Right? So, um, so that will give you a really large baseline. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so all these kind of competing questions, they, they, they make a lot of interesting engineering trade-offs because the engineering really depends on the science that you want to, um, that you want to um, study. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I've got a question which is sort of, um, kind of less, less about the science itself. Uh, so you developed all these um, kind of, you know, computational imaging uh, techniques during a PhD and kind of during a bachelor's. So the, the transition of going from that to, to working in uh, like you know, an astrophysics environment, is, is that something that you yourself sought out? Like, you know, did you have a passion for astrophysics and you needed to, you wanted to find an application for these techniques you were developing? Or was it like, you know, one option and like a, a list of many of the things that you could have gone for? Like, how did you um, end up working in, the, in Pasadena, I suppose? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, I guess, well, first of all, I've always been, um, kind of passionate about uh, physics and astrophysics. And even the work on clouds was very uh, physics involved. It wasn't astrophysics, but it was still, uh, you know, um, you know, the cloud physics uh, is very interesting and, and um, it's complicated as well. And so I always been uh, passionate about these kind of questions where, um, well, maybe new observations. So for example, in the cloud physics example, because 
um, remote sensing and, and, and satellites typically have these, these, um, uh, these models that assume that everything is homogeneous and so on, um, or layered and so on. And so you can't really study a lot of the interesting uh, three-dimensional processes or like mixing and trainment uh, of, of aerosols and so on. Um, and, and so what people do is they study them through simulations. And so uh, we develop all these complicated simulations of, of, of uh, single clouds and large eddy simulations and so on. And what we wanted to do is give an alternative. We wanted to look at them uh, through observations. And so um, I guess I've, I've, I was looking for a place where I can sort of merge uh, this the, the observation and the simulation in, in a way that's interesting. And, and what I found was, uh, to me, doing this, this type of, uh, so coming with no background in astrophysics, doing this type of interdisciplinary research is, is sort of like doing the same research that you always do, but in a foreign language. So, so I don't know if anyone on, on call speaks Swedish, but I'm going to use this in, as an example. So imagine that you're moving to Sweden and now you're expected to do the same science, but everything is in Swedish. Um, and so what I found was that the best way to do that is to immerse yourself um, in, in, in Sweden. So if you're going to try to do a Swedish in Liverpool, that's not going to work. And so, um, and so by joining the EHT and by actually having centers like your center that, that facilitate interaction between data science and, and other types of science and so on. When you have literally uh, postdocs from astrophysics and postdocs from computer science sitting together or, or interacting on a weekly basis, that's how you get things uh, working. And that's how I feel like um, um, this interdisciplinary science should be happening. And, and, and so this is something that's been, um, I think very crucial for my research that I had uh, the ability to work with uh, so so the last project, the tomography project that I've talked about, we have um, people from uh, electrical engineering. I, I, there's one professor from electrical engineering in Berkeley. There's another colleague from from Google Research. There's an astrophysicist from Princeton, and there's there's me and 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 uh, Katie, my PI. And so it's a good mix of people sitting and meeting every week um, and hammering down these problems. Um, and so. Um, I don't know if I fully answered your question, but uh, I don't think you have. Yeah. So, so when you're in these like big collaborations with people from different backgrounds, do you, do you have like sort of like a, a guidebook or like a style guide? You know, when when referring to these concepts, refer to them as as, as X, for instance, because you know you get people in the same as you're saying, people from different backgrounds in the same meeting talking about different things, but with different vocabularies. So, is that just like a, a like an unconscious drifting towards the same kind of terminology, or is that something that's kind of enforced from the start? Um, I think, I think what, well, my approach, I adopt the terminology of the people, of the, uh, the people that I work with. So if I, so now I'm, I'm adopting the terminology of, of the HT and beforehand I was adopting the terminology of the cloud physicists we were working with. And so, um, so I find that again, it, it was best to immerse myself in Swedish and, and start speaking the language. Um, and the, the quicker you can do that, the better. And I think the same thing goes the other way. If you're a, an astrophysicist working on a very data science or data intensive problem, um, I think you should immerse yourself in the language of, of, of the people studying the data science. Um, and it will, give, it will go a long way. And the first time you do it will be really challenging. But the second time you do it, you will see that there is a sort of like, there's, there's a rhythm to it. It's not completely like you, you don't sit with a book of, of, of this points to this, this points to this. You start just speaking the language. Um, and then, um, and, and, and it's also not just a matter of terminology. I think it's all, also a matter of perspective. The perspective is different. The types of problems that I will try to focus on will be different than the types of problems that other people in the HU will focus on. And, and, and bridging what's interesting is also, uh, is also a challenge. So this is interesting to me. This is interesting to you. How can we build a project that incorporates what's interesting to both of us? Um, and, and so, so this is also um, coming from the da data science side. Um, I think a lot of the time the challenge is you want to find problems where um, you don't want to be a data science engineer where you're, um, someone says, well, th this is the problem. Can you please solve it for us, right? You want to be um, a, part, a part of it. You want to uh, come up with a problem that's interesting to you in a different field and so on. Absolutely. 
Okay, I think I'll just quickly check uh, online to see if anybody's put their hand up or anybody has any questions. If not, we'll go uh, go back to Fraser. <laughs> I've got money. But... <laughs> uh, okay, nobody online? Um, there's lots of astrophysicists online. Surely somebody's got an astrophysics question. Uh, normally, normally Alberto's got one, but he's, he's left. Okay, Fraser. Okay. Um, so, well, my work's on machine learning for signal analysis. It's all two dimensional sets. So, I'm wondering about the use a similar process to presumably principal component analysis when you're explaining how the your random rotational field is made up of several linear interpolations of. Um, principal components or principal fields how many fields do you actually need to approximate every um like random field in your set because presumably right. like presumably they're ordered in order of like the amount of variance which they explain and as you keep on going further and further these ones become less important but like right reasonable yeah that's that's a good question and so i want to i'll answer your question but beforehand I'll, I'll say a couple of other things um and so firstly i one thing that was interesting is it's not trivial um to to, to find these modes i kind of skipped over this and i said well we find the top modes but imagine that if you have like a some pd solver and you want to find these the, you want to perform this pca um and so so there's there is a whole field of randomized linear algebra um that is dealing with interesting problems like that of how how do you do um uh these uh, well, this was a randomized uh, svd or randomized um subspace iteration and so so and there are uh, you know other interesting computational problems how do you do it efficiently and there are these uh Krilov methods and so on so i can talk about this uh longer offline, but, but I think the, right now, it was kind of like a trial and error, but there, there should be this sweet spot because we don't wanna start modeling the noise, right? And so, so our observations don't have the infinite resolution to capture all of the randomness in this random field. And so if we keep going down this, um, uh, down this sequence to lower and lower variance and, and, and higher and higher, frequencies in this in these uh, modes, then we're going to actually be fitting mostly the noise. And so we, we use something like 60, which was uh, this number was literally just, uh, you know, we came up with the, we came up with the number and it worked and we didn't really test it and or, or came up with a theory to why and so on. But but this, this will depend on uh, your instrumental resolution. So again, if your instrument is blurring out everything below, you know, mode 60, then you don't want to keep, uh, you don't want to model this. And it also depends on um, how fast the sequence decay, right? So, so how fast does the, the eigenvalues decay in this um, decomposition? And so these are two things that I guess this will depend on, but I, I honestly, we didn't, we didn't research this so much. Okay, so I think if you have more questions, if you've got one more quick one, then, then or like relatively quick. Um, otherwise, I can pass on. I've got um, people say it for me. It's about, cheap. it's about the ray casting um, in the radiance fields. I'm wondering what happens near the event horizon. Typically, with a radiance field, you have linear ray casting. It's used for optical reconstructions. But obviously, you have a, a black hole which curves all of the ray casts. So, Near the event horizon, do you get interesting effects of the reconstruction, or is it? Um, yeah, yeah, that's um, yeah, that's a good question. So this was one. Uh, this was also an interesting extension of of these rays, uh, ray casting, I guess, um, or to to situations where the rays curve around and they, they're 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 being gravitationally pulled. Um, and so, so in reality, what we do is we. We we find all these ray paths by solving solving some some ODEs, um, and these these paths are called the geodesic geodesics. And so you have this curved space time, and you can find these paths. And some of them 
loop around the black hole more than once. Um, you know, when you can find these exact paths that will loop around many, many times around the black hole and will join the photon ring. Um, but we don't trace these paths, right? They, these paths are just very unique pixels in the image are again, blurred out by our instrument. So there's no need to, to trace them. So we do, we do trace paths that go, uh, that are either direct or loop around once, loop around the black hole once. Um, is there anything interesting happening close to the event horizon? I mean, there's the, um, the, the, um, or close to the event horizon, we don't have good supervision. And so whatever is happening there, we consider it as, as, um, uh, not suspicious, but this is more like garbage in, garbage out. And so, and so um, we we typically only look at the part of the medium that we are um, that we think that that we have good supervision and we can tell what's happening there. Um, close to the event horizon, many things break down in our model, including but not limited to the Keplerian orbit, um, the you know the geodesics, um, the um, a, a lot of things break down, and so we're not attempting to recover anything there right now.